My guest this afternoon is Mark Haddon, um, who is, I guess, best known to most of you um, for uh, a novel which he wrote a number of years ago, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Time. And no doubt we will touch briefly on that, but we'll talk about lots of other things. Um, Mark, it's great to see you. Good and see thank you very Thank you very much for agreeing to doing this. Um, can I can I just ask what difference this COVID thing has made to you? And I've spoken with a number of um, in the, these little broadcasts which I've done with a number of people who write and who are creative, and some of whom have thought, "Yes, I've now got fantastic space to create." and found that they could do that. And others have told me that they found it almost impossible. Um, well, I suspect like my, most writers, my life is locked down most of the time anyway. Yep. Um, I spend a lot of my life in a room when I'm writing. So in a sense, it hasn't made, hasn't made much difference. I remember a, a good friend of mine, uh, Molly McGran, a novelist with whom I used to teach. She would tell the students, if you want to write a novel, your ass has got to make friends with the chair. Um, and that's the case. Uh, so in a way, in a way, what's happening in the outside world is, I think, is not as relevant as it is for some people. I know people have found it really, really hard, but it's, sure. it's not too dissimilar from my, my normal life. Sure. Um, can we talk about you as a little boy? <laughs> you certainly can, yes. <laughs> uh, about what, what sort of, what sort of childhood you had and um, whether there were elements in the things that you do now um, that you can see started when you were when you were a little chap. Uh, well, let me start by saying something that has got me into trouble before, but it's nevertheless true. I mean, I think I was last asked this in Milton Keynes. Someone asked about my relationship to Northampton, where I grew up, um, and I think everything. Everything I've done which seems good to me is in proportion to the distance, the metaphorical distance I put between myself and Northampton. <laughs> I'm now in trouble with so many people, aren't I, for having said that. Um, I know lots of, lots of wonderful people from there, um, but it was a very, it was a very culturally narrow and quite sort of, stifling milieu that I came from, a little village on the edge of, edge of Northampton. Um, I remember it mostly as, you know, Angel Delight and smoking in cars and the two Ronnies on the television. And for a, for a certain person that has a, that has a flavor. But in terms of um, the wider world, it, was, it feels like a real backwater now. So a lot of what I do now it's about exploring a much, much bigger world. I still feel I'm still feel I'm getting I'm getting away from it and looking at looking at a much bigger world. But the one thing, the one thing that really stays with me, uh, is that my father was an architect. Right. Um, he had a, he had a partnership in Northampton. Um, he actually left school at I think about fourteen. Um, joined the army, went back to college, trained as an architect, and was quite a success. Um, Although, ironically, uh, the buildings he was doing most of when I was a teenager were, were slaughterhouses. During the big building slump in the 70s, you know, hospitals, schools, housing, very little was happening. But he struck up a, a business partnership with Dalgetty Buswell. So uh, he used to bring plans home for us to draw on the back of, um, as dads did from their offices. And, and we'd flip them over and we'd draw on the back. But if you flip them back again, you'd find a design for blood channels and um, feather tanks and machines for killing cows and pigs. And, and our house was full of free mince pies. Dad's architecture, I mean, I joke about it now, but it has somehow gone deep into my brain. I can't, I can't write a scene now without being able to draw a very exact floor plan of the room in which it's happening. Um, and indeed, every house I've spent a decent amount of time in, I can draw you a floor plan of. It's how I see the world. I, despite not being an architect, there's a sort of architectural filter still in there. And, um, maybe that's 
uh, one of the re- one of the things which makes your writing um, uh, just trying to think of the right words for this, but um, one can picture as one reads everything. I mean, the descriptions are extraordinary. And one can picture all the scenes, and perhaps that's perhaps that's why. Perhaps because you are seeing them in that way. I am someone who's in love with stuff. I mean, specific stuff. I mean, clothes don't really do it for me, but uh, objects, landscapes, buildings. Um, I feel, I feel I'm missing something if I read a novel which is mostly about dialogue and ideas and emotions. I need to be able to see the furniture. I need to know what's out in that window. And if I don't, if I don't have that, both when I'm reading and when I'm writing, everything seems to sort of drift without any anchor whatsoever. It doesn't quite seem real. And did the, I think um, not enough people know you as an artist because you have almost another career, don't you? Well, less so these days. I was an illustrator for a very long time. Oh. I, I should say, I think a lot of a lot of what I've done in my life has been driven by, not only by getting away from Northampton, but an inability to do a normal job. Right. I think the longest I've been employed in a sort of nine to five office type situation was seven weeks when I worked for um, a mail order cycle company in Edgware in North London. After seven weeks, I couldn't I couldn't bear it anymore being told to do by what to do by someone else. And I rang up and pretended that I'd broken my leg and couldn't come in. And that was it. That's that's the longest period of employment in my entire life. So from very early on, I knew that I wanted to write. Uh, and I knew I wanted to make pictures of some sort. And of course, if you if you grow up with someone vaguely artistic, like, like my father, someone who's an architect who occasionally sort of does watercolours, you think drawing is what everyone does when they're little. Yes. But I think maybe it was exceptional. It was assumed that we just we just made pictures. You went to a posh school. I did. I did. <laughs> well, <laughs> not 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 situated terribly far from where I'm sitting no, at the moment. No. Um, what but was that? That doesn't, that doesn't quite sort of get the experience right. But, but both <laughs> my sets of grandparents were, were very working class. My right. father's my father's parents were employed re- respectively in a in a bed factory and a boot and shoe factory in Northampton. And right. he, he was a working class boy made good. And it was the same on my mother's side as well. So yes, I went to this this posh school, but it was a very, very alien environment. I I was possibly the first and only member of my family ever to have gone to a a private school. And um, with the exception of, I think, a cousin in Australia, perhaps the first ever person um, in our family to go to university. How did you find that? Put it like this. It has been said before by other people, but when I do prison visiting, which I occasionally do these days. I've, I've done talks, I've done interviews, um, I've done some voluntary work in prisons. <laughs> and when I step into those corridors with that smell and that clanging noise and that sense of sort of tension in the air, the testosterone, um, I think something here rings a bell for me. I reckon I could survive in this place using the skills that I honed during my <laughs> during my school days. You know, I'd hate the lack of outside and fresh air, but when it comes to getting getting along with other prisoners, I feel I had I had five years of training. Did it have great influence on you? Did you learn a lot in the place, or, or just these survival things? I mean, of course, I learned lots, but I I got good exam results, but. I think I learned most when I was learning on my own. There was a peculiar thrill to being in the library, for example, reading books that weren't on the syllabus. That's always, that's always really excited me. It was such a place of rigid rules and conformity that the most creative things seemed to be doing stuff that you weren't meant to do. You know, for some people, it was it was smoking and drinking, and for me, I think it was it was going into the library and re- reading other books. I will also say, um, and it does feel rather odd saying this, given where you're sitting, and so how ne- how near I am now, metaphorically, to where this happened. The most 
educational moment of my entire school career it came very early on when I, when I was beaten um, for something I didn't do, but that, but that was not the relevant part of the, the story. I, I was beaten and by my housemaster. And a couple of months later, the man was sitting um, at our lunch table and one of the more forward boys said to him, sir, how can you justify beating people? And he looked at this boy and um, he says, I can justify it because I always know they are guilty. And in that moment, I, I changed from an extremely naive young man who, who knew one ought to be good and that the good were always rewarded and ev everything was right with the world into someone who was profoundly cynical. And I think I learned right then that one should never entirely trust people who have power. And I think that's been true for me ever since. And that, that principle I learned at school and stuck with me more strongly than almost anything else. That's really interesting. We, may I ask which house you were in? <laughs> I was in Lord House. Up. You were Lord in Lord House. House. So, so people can put that together with the dates if they want. I, 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 I think I might have guessed. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And were you, you've obviously got a great love of the classics. It came rather late. Um, I did. Did it, come at, did it come at school? No, it certainly didn't at school. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid the school is getting rather bashing in the early part of this interview. <laughs> yeah, I'm, but, I, but so I, be it. I was taught. I was taught. I was taught Latin and Greek, and I was put off them for a long time. Yes. In my twenties, um, I realised that I had, I had no other languages, and most of my friends spoke two, three, four languages, and it seemed time to try and catch up with them. And I thought I'd choose a dead language because at least I didn't have to learn how to speak it. And um, I taught myself uh, ancient Greek and sat an A-level. And having passed that, I then taught myself Latin as well. You know, they, they lie slightly dormant at the back of my mind. You know, it, take, it would take a while to revive them, but they're definitely there. And they enabled me to read texts in the original that I'd only ever read in translation. And that that's quite an exciting thing to be able to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. So do I take it that your sons don't go to um, a school like this? <laughs> no, they don't. No, they go, to the, they, go, they go to the state school. Well, one of them no longer goes, but they go to the state schools nearby. Yes. As, as a good friend of mine once said, she said, my mother told me that schools were where you learn to get on with the people who live near you. And I, I still think that holds very true. Were you ever annoyed with your parents that they sent you to a place like this? <laughs> there were so many reasons I was annoyed with my parents. I can't, I, I'm not sure how far down the list it comes. I was, I was aware that there was a very, very odd dynamic going on. It was my father who wanted me to go there. And he felt that it would be, I think, a kind of entree into a world that he only stood on the edge of and could never enter himself. He was like a lot of men, I think of that generation, which was a very mobile generation after the war. Self-made man, um, he became a successful businessman, architect, but he doesn't have that ease with, with culture, with music, with literature, with art, that he really wanted to. Um, so on some level, I think I was sent to that school on his behalf to be the person that he would have been if he were leading another life. The problem is that that kind of education involves learning how to argue and to disagree and to, to talk with people who hold different opinions. That's what real education is about. And, and that's what I think he never had. He was never able to go across that line and accept that difference of opinion was the very salt of life. Yes. But when you go to university, hopefully that, that be does become your world. Argument and, and disagreement are vitally important. And I think that instead of it leading me into a world that, that he envied, it led me into a world which was on the far side of a, a huge chasm by the school's 
token by 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 um their view you did extraordinarily well i mean you were you were um a, a success as far as they were concerned i was yes no i ha they have not been invited back i wonder why that is <laughs> i wonder why that is I, mean, I find that quite extraordinary well okay in for a penny in for a pound Go on. Um, I know someone who is um, who is also an alumni, uh, al alumnus of the school. I think we, I yep. think you and I have talked about him before, but no names, no pack drill. Sure. Someone who was um, who was bullied a good deal at school, and later became quite a successful actor, and talked about the experience of being on the stage. And even now, many decades later, there is still a part of his brain which thinks. You, the people who bullied me, are sitting down there and you're paying to look at me up here. <laughs> and that's been one of the one of the driving forces in his life. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? So you leave you leave school and you go off to Oxford. Mm -hmm. And was that was that a, a culture shock when you got there? For you, was it a, was that a, a, a good a good thing in your life? I think so. I was among a group of people, most of whom are still very, very good friends, all of whom who came from state schools. So I was in a sort of slightly protective bubble in this world. I'm also aware that I did very little at Oxford. Um, I look back and think that I was an oil tanker which needed turning around through 180 degrees. I went to a school which was particularly good at um, sending people into business or the army or banking, but I had to go in an opposite direction. And it takes a lot of effort and time to turn an oil tank around. And I yes. think very, very little else was happening at Oxford, but I was turning the oil tanker. And did you approve of, of Oxford? Oxford is such a... Well, I, I'm sitting in Oxford right now, and my, and my yes. wife teaches I'm about you. I'm talking about the university and the, yes. and the system in general. It's such a vast and diverse and sprawling institution that to have one opinion about the whole place is pointless and reductive. There's some right. fantastic things about it. There are some things about it which are a lot better now than they were at the time. Um, and, you know, and everyone's experience of it was very, very different. It was, it was good for me. And I, and I think going to that sort of school gave me, <laughs> gave me the sort of presumption you need to survive in a place like the Oxford of the early 1980s. So you start, you start work, um, I mean, working for yourself, really, as an illustrator. I do, yes. And you, and you haven't been to art school. No. So you're self-taught. I am. Did you have a natural facility for it, do you think? Or did you get it from looking at other people's illustrations? Or where did that come from? Um, I don't think I have much natural ability in any way whatsoever, but I'm extremely bloody-minded. I can't do another job. I know what I want to do. So I burnt, I burnt a lot of bridges behind me. So I have, yeah. to make, I have to make it work. That's a really useful technique. Yes. To actually burn bridges and, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very jealous of people both, both in, all, in all the arts who have a kind of natural felicity. I mean, you, it's, it's clearest isn't with artists when you see them drawing. Certain, certain artists are incapable of drawing an uninteresting line. It just flows, it flows through them and flows out of their hands. Um, and I've always been extremely envious of that and known that I will never ever be able to do that. Um, so I have to find, I have to find another way round. Funny enough, I was just remembering this morning, uh, thinking about my, the, the artists I loved when I was a teenager, some of which are, of course, very embarrassing, some of which I, I, I still like. And I remember enjoying the portraits of Brian Organ. Really? He, he, well, I was a teenager at the time. Um, okay. He did an infamous, an infamous double portrait of uh, Charles and Di, which still hangs in the National Portrait Gallery, I think. 
I now realize looking back that what I liked about them was here was a successful artist who'd somehow managed to avoid doing perspective or depth by placing someone in a very flat light against a flat wall. Yes. And there was a little part of me which thinks, if he can get away with it, maybe other people can get away with it. Mm. I, sh I should say there are actually a couple of portraits of his that I absolutely love um, these days. He does a, a wonderful one of Harold Macmillan, sort of looking over a dark ledge, so he looks spooky in the way that Goya's dog looks. Yes. Um, and there's a, another lovely one of Roy Jenkins, which is a kind of double portrait, which is a portrait of a portrait with Roy Jenkins in front of it. But I loved him because it seemed like a sort of <laughs> a cheat's way into painting. And you actually man managed to make a living doing book illustration. Book and magazine illustrations. I, I owe a lot to the Nursing Times, for example, um, who I think paid my rent for about eight to ten years. You must be unbelievably bloody minded because um, the problems of, of actually um, getting into that market and earning a living doing it over a period of time are huge. They are, and your persistence is the thing you need. I mean, I, when I talk to people now who are trying, to, younger people who are trying to become illustrators, I always say that there is one principle which always served me well, which is send 20 things off in the post and every time you get a rejection you send something else off at the same time so you always know there are 20 pieces of you out there begging for attention um don't wait until you're rejected to try again just keep selling yourself all the time did you get better at it as you uh, better at the um at the craft the more you did do you think I did, I did very slowly, such that when I look at some of my, the earliest picture books I did for children, I winced slightly when I, re when I realized there were certain things I was incapable of doing. In fact, to refer back to Brian Organ, perspective was one of them. Um, what's, what's quite odd about picture books for children is that charm is really important. Um, it's a really hard thing to pinpoint, but I think we all know great illustrators for children who were in some sense unable to draw um, and I don't just mean the sort of Quentin Blake although he he has a, and I think he said when he's teaching at the, the Royal College of Art you don't need to be able to draw you have to have something about you, you have to have character have flavor you have to have spirit and that's the thing which really really matters but far better than you know an accurate line people like I think Roger Hargreaves who did the Mr Men books who, let's be honest, can't really draw at all. But there is something there, isn't there? Both of those men found a voice early on, didn't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And did you have a voice? Or did you <laughs> vary it from, depending <laughs> on whether it was the nursing times you would try to uh, get something in or some, something else, some other magazine or? I think I was hobbled by the fact that I always secretly wanted to be serious. If I'd, if I'd been at ease with my sort of uh, more humorous self who was doing cartoons and writing for children's books, I think I might have found a voice there. But I was always ill at ease. Um, and I think it was only when I started to write eventually for adults that I felt in a place that might become home. I mean, that was the question that was going through my mind as, as I was listening to you saying that, because the, the, things, the, the things in life which you are looking at, the topics that you're looking at in Curious and Porpoise are, are, are not children's topics, are they? I mean, they're, they're enormous. And I, I was just wondering about the frustration that you must have felt during those long years before you got to that. Well, there were, there, were, there were two levels of frustration, um, one on the surface and one underneath. The one underneath was the fact that I was trying to write novels for adults all the time. And I'm sh I think I have thrown away five complete novels and a countless number of half completed novels before I got to Curious Incident. Sometimes when I tell that to um, two young writers, there's a sort of horrified chill which spreads around the room. But I... I had, to, I had to learn it and I had to learn it the hard way. 
And I, I think if I hadn't thrown away five novels before that, there were things which I would never have understood about the way in which writing works. The superficial frustration when I was writing for children was that there are certain topics you simply can't cover in books for children. And I, I don't mean sex, drugs and rock and roll. There are plenty of books these days which we still, which are quite dark, which talk yeah. about death, sex, whatever. Um, but there are things that become important as an adult, which you have no comprehension of as a child. And those are things about, about money, about keeping a job, about long-term relationships, about getting old, about caring for someone who is ill, about having elderly parents, for example. And as you get older, those become more and more important. And they're the kind of things I wanted to write about. And children have no conception of those things. And I think it's always been true that I want to write for a version of myself who doesn't know what I've written. Well, I read, I mean, just this, it, it appears again and again, um, but some of your descriptions I find quite extraordinary. I wanted to ask you, here you write here in the beginning of The Porpoise, um, the same is a ribbon of pitted khaki sliding west. How, how hard do you have to work to come up with phrases like that? Ooh. Do they come naturally to you? They come with some pushing. I, I'll tell you what, I come up with a lot of them. Most of them don't work, and a lot of them, a lot of them happen with editing. You just get them right. You know, it's, it's a kind of boiling down. It's like a sauce. Right. You know, you, it, it, the phrase might be in a much longer, much longer paragraph. You just chip everything else away. Save the best bits. That's a really good principle, I think. That would that would have been in a, that would have been the sort of the, the tiny bust chipped out of a lot of marble which got thrown away. But I do, I do love, I do love a good phrase. One of the reasons that Virginia Woolf is perhaps my, yeah, my favourite novelist, is that in her best novels. There is for me something worth double underlining on every single page. I'll say to myself, that sentence is, is perfect. I could just sit here and say that to myself several times and I will remember it. So that's always been something that I aspire to, getting the phrases right. When you write, I mean, I think um, these two books, Curious and uh, Four points. Um, I, I think they're, they're major works. Um, to what extent do you know at the beginning where you're going, and how much do you actually find out in the process of the writing? I often hear writers ask this question, and it, the question itself presumes that you approach each book in a roughly similar way. Um, I describe it often as the whole experience of writing from book to book as staggering through a dark wood at night, having no idea of the way in which I'm going, desperately searching for something that will that will work. Um, right. And as a result of which, everything I've written has started in a very different way. I mean, I wrote a collection of short stories um, before the porpoise called The Pier Falls. Four of the short stories in there began their life as plays, which simply didn't work. It took me a long time to realize, although I've written one play for the stage, I'm not really a, a writer for theatre. And over about a year and a half, I slowly turned these plays into short stories and they worked. And, and at that point I thought it would have been so much easier not to have traveled in this large painful circle to find to find myself in this position. If only I'd known there were stories to start with, surely I could have cut out a lot of effort, but it, it never works like that. You seem to, I seem to learn with each book how to write a book and then forget it at the end of having written that book and then sit down and think, how does one write a book after all? And that's something I've heard a lot of writers say, you forget how to write a novel after each novel and you have to learn it again. Do you remember um, why you wrote Curious? This will seem um, rather vulgar and superficial, but it is true. Um, I sat down thinking about opening scenes for novels. 
what would be a good opening scene for a novel? And I remember writing three down, one of which was simply the image of a, of a dog on a lawn with a garden fork thrust through it. Um, I remember writing this and laughing quietly to myself upstairs. And my, my wife later said, do you think real writers laugh at their own jokes? Uh, which I've never let her forget. It seemed at the time that that, that scene implied a story and it was both dark and vivid and to me quite funny. Um, and the story was driven by the need to find a voice that would describe that scene in a way that was gripping and darkly amusing at the same time. That's how Christopher came about. Christopher came about because, Christopher came about as the owner of a voice. I found the voice and then I needed someone to own that voice. Were you surprised? I don't want to talk too much about Curious because you must, it, it obviously took up so much of your time and you must, I don't know how many interviews you've done on that, <laughs> but um, it was inordinately successful. Did that surprise you? Whenever people ask me that, I think, if I said no, what kind of monster would I be? Oh God, I'm just trying to. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether I'm going to manage to ask you anything which you haven't <laughs> no, been no, asked no. before. No. When, when the presumption is that I might not have been surprised if I told <laughs> myself, "I know this book will sell several million copies. I'm, I, I should be locked up." Frankly, no. I remember having a, a talk with my wife shortly before, just after I sent it off to my agent, yeah. um, and I was. I think I was saying if it sold 5,000 copies, I'd be very, very happy indeed. Just knowing that I had a, what I thought was an adult novel out there in the world being published. And then something very, very peculiar happened. And I, I remember the moment at which it became profoundly unreal. I was in a taxi in London with Claire Alexander, my agent. We were traveling to um, a publisher to, because they wanted to talk about the novel. We already knew that people were quite excited about it. And she took a phone call. And after the phone call, she said, Mark, that was the Italian auction for the novel, which is happening live at the moment. I felt as if I'd stepped through the mirror into sort of a Woody Allen version of my own life. And um, from that moment on, it was, it was positive, of course it was, but it also an extremely peculiar experience. Did it embarrass you? No, it didn't embarrass me at all, but it definitely flummoxed me. Um, I think one of the best ways I found of explaining it is to say that, like many people, when I was a child, I had fantasies about flying. Fantasies about a flying car, for example. Wouldn't it be amazing to get into a car and just be able to take off and fly? But if you're driving down the M40 these days and your car actually takes off and flies, it's not a dream come true. You're thinking, dear God in heaven, how do I control this thing? So it was both a dream come true and, and an uncontrollable flying car at the same time. And a good deal of effort since then on my part has been put into keeping it at a distance. Right. So that I... Firstly, so that I don't become the person who wrote Curious Incident. So that doesn't become my, my job. And partly so that I still have my feet on the ground. I hope I still do. Well, I'm, I'm sure you have, yeah. And I'm trying to remember um, exactly when you wrote uh, Porpoise, which is a novel I also want to talk about. Was well, that was that just before you were ill, or was that? All well, time now seems to have done a very very peculiar thing on account of lockdown. There's, there's, there's sort of, to ask you about the illness as well. Yes, well, there's there's sort of before COVID and after COVID, isn't there in terms of time? So the yeah. porpoise came out nearly two years ago now. So it was written in the preceding two years to eighteen months before that. Right. Um, but as you were saying, um, I wasn't in fact ill, but I had um, a triple heart bypass 
um, almost exactly the moment that the novel came out. Um, I had, um, I have for a number of years had sort of increasing trouble running. I've always cycled and, and, and run. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I was having trouble running up hills. I had to stop and start and stop and start. It was the wrong kind of tiredness. I said to several doctors to their utter incomprehension. <laughs> um, but I found a very good GP who, who, who was very sympathetic and understood. And to cut a long story short, I, I went for an MRI scan and got a letter okay. quite soon afterwards saying, you need to come in here very quickly to the cardiac unit at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And I still have a very vivid memory of, of um, having an angiogram, having that long catheter slipped into my wrist and up into my heart chambers and back down again and lying on the table. And um, the doctor saying, I think you'll probably need a heart bypass. And feeling quite tearful, A, on account of five milligrams of uh, intravenous diazepam and B, on account of the shock of hearing this. And I think my first words were, will you get me running again? And he said, we'll get you running again. And I, within, within a matter of weeks, I was, I was in hospital waiting to go under the knife. How nervous were you at that time? Not as nervous as my family. Right. I think a lot of people will say this. I I spent I spent a lot of my life suffering extreme health anxiety on a sort of pathological level. Right. But when it actually happens to you, you realize it's not that bad after all. So one thing one thing the heart bypass did it cured any health anxiety I had. Actually ha going to have an operation in which your chest is cranked open and your, your heart is mucked around with is so much easier than being frightened about the possibility of having that operation. Yes. There's an odd stillness at the center of the storm. I, I sort of remember with a strange affection, the bed that I spent 10 days in before that operation, which became my little home with the, with the, with the bedside table, with my own books and presents people have bought in and my own pot of Darjeeling tea to mix with the, the wards boiling water because hospital tea is not very good. Um, but of course it was absolutely terrifying for my family. Right. I realized in retrospect that that's what exactly what I was trying to do. Like there was some problem as, and as often, is often the case, I thought if I just push a little harder, I'm sure I can get through this. And I now yeah. realize I was, I was in danger of, um, of having a heart attack in some distant corner of Whiteham Woods um, on the edge of Oxford. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. Having gone through it and having talked to lots of other people who've gone through it, not least because you go to a kind of rehab gym afterwards, I realise that for lots of people, I think particularly men of a certain age, it comes as a huge shock to realise that their bodies are machines which can go wrong. So the whole um, experience of perhaps having a heart attack and then having heart surgery feels like a kind of grotesque assault on the person they are. Whereas because I knew something was wrong in advance and I went from one doctor to another and the, the GP I finally saw was absolutely wonderful. I feel that he and I as a team beat the Grim Reaper along with the amazing surgical team at the John Radcliffe. So I came out the other end feeling that I'd won. Sure. Uh, not, not, not that I'd been a, a, assaulted, that I, that I got there in time. Strange thing, really, because a lot of people who have heart attacks or have heart problems mm. um, and are lucky enough to, to get uh, for that to be found before they, they actually have a heart attack, um, have abused themselves terribly. They've either been heavy smokers, heavy drinkers, um, they've done too many drugs. Uh, they're perhaps overweight. They've eaten the wrong food. You're a, you've been a vegetarian for ages. You've kept yourself incredibly fit. Well, I was, I was a vegetarian smoker for quite a while, but then I was also a vegetarian runner. Um, I think that the bad choice I made was to have the parents I had. 
my father had a sort of stent fitted at 50. And um, you realize, well, I realized when this happened to me, and I realized when it happens, when serious illness strikes friends of mine, that we underestimate the amount of chance in our health. We are told from an early age that our health is in our hands. And if we do everything right, then we will live long and happily to a, to a fit and content old age. And then most of us realize at some point that the dice is being rolled all the time. And you have to accept that. There is a limit to your ability to make your life perfect. There's a, there's a limit to our ability to make anything perfect. And that's a useful thing to remember, I think. I read the piece that you that you wrote, um, a terrific piece, I thought, about the NHS and how wonderful that was and the 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 help that you had through that. And um and I thought that was smashing. And you mentioned in there um that you you suffer from what um people call bipolar two. So may I may I ask you about that? You may, yes. Basically, we're talking about anxiety, depression, presumably. Yes, funny enough, the anxiety. I learned to. Um, I learned to get over the anxiety, given that I'm a very determined, project-oriented person. Anxiety yep. was hugely blighting my life, and that anxiety always came to an absolute fever pitch whenever I flew. Um, I knew that I would die. I knew that I would die in a, in a flaming tube of twisted aluminium on some godforsaken mountainside in the middle of nowhere with 200 <laughs> strangers sort of howling and soiling themselves. Um, I mean, I really did know. I mean, I, I, I stepped onto a plane thinking these were the, the last moments in my life. Um, and my, my wife would often say uh, that we get on holiday and I, I would know nothing about the holiday. I'd be surprised at this hotel or that location. And I would have to say, there was no point in me finding out about the holiday because I knew we would die before we got there. That was a horrible, that was a horrible way to live. And I, it always haunted me, the idea that I would be on my deathbed or in my rocking chair and think I'd been granted one life on one amazing planet. And there were parts of it I didn't see because I was scared. That was seemed such a terrible, terrible thought to have. And that drove me to learn how to how to how to fly without fear. So I took five, six flying lessons in a pipe of Cherokee. I took two accompanied flights um, with uh, Carol Cornwell, who used to work as cabin crew on Concord. Um, I took a flight in a glider. I went on, I think, four fear of flying courses at Heathrow. And I, I, I made myself get used to flying. And as a result of that, I can now fly not, not comfortably. You know, I, I still need a bit of, of, of diazepam and red wine in those little plastic bottles to get me right. through, but it doesn't feel terrifying in the same way. And I, I think the anxiety went away as a result of that, as a result of forcing myself to do the most frightening thing I could think of. Right. I'm still stuck with these hugely fluctuating moods, mostly, mostly depression, very sort of long, dark periods in which I can do no writing, no reading, nothing. Anxiety and depression are meant to be brother and sister in a way, or often described as brother and sister. The people who have one quite often have the other. I do seem to have split the family up. I seem to have you, <laughs> sent the brother anxiety away, but I still have the you, sister depression. So you've worked out how to banish the one. I do remember as a child being very, very anxious and sad a lot of the time. I think that's true of many children. Right. Um, but I, it took a very, very long time to realize that that was the inside of my head and not the flavor of the whole world. Right. And you don't do that until, until other people start talking candidly about what is going on inside their heads. And I, it was, I think it was a function of our family and the place where we grew up that I, no one talked about what was going on inside their heads. In sure. fact, to be honest, if I cast my, eye, my mind back, as a young child, I wasn't even aware of the fact that other people had subjective experiences on the inside yep. of their heads. I, and I think it, I, wasn't, I was a teenager when I realized that 
that sadness and that fear were not the wallpaper of the entire world, but were ha something happening to me. And other people lived much easier lives. And some people just sort of skipped like gazelles through the whole thing, blissfully, blissfully unaware. Might it be that we're born with the propensity for it? And uh, many, many of us, and particularly creative people, I think, have that, what used to be called melancholia, mm. um, but that in teenage years, some people banish it in some way. Mm. Um, some people maybe embrace it, I don't know. Um, and then it becomes a bloody nuisance. Well, let me just pick something out of debilitating. Because it's debilitating. It's very, very debilitating. And just to pick something out of what you said, <clears throat> I'm always very nervous about people linking creativity and depression or mental illness together, um, suggesting that one is the cost of the other or one is indeed the cause of the other. Um, it's certainly true that the two often go hand in hand in many lives. Um, Kay Redfield Jameson, who's a very famous psychiatrist who's, who suffers from bipolar one, who's written widely on the subject. She actually produced a league table of well-known artists um, and ranked them according to the number of times they were admitted to psychiatric hospital and needed serious inpatient care. And the outcome of which was that if you were a successful poet, you were almost certain to end up in a psychiatric hospital at some time. And at the bottom of the scale, I think it was architect, and architects were almost, almost sane. And in between those two, all the other, all the other artistic careers were, were ranked. So it's true there is a correlation, but I don't think it's causation. What I think is that there are people who at school fit in very, very easily. You know, the relationships come to them without any problem whatsoever. They're liked, they like other people. There's another group of people, and I was certainly a part of this group, who find life is a constant problem. Just getting from minute to minute for one reason or another requires input. Nothing happens without, without thinking about how it happens. And I think both artists and people who have longer term mental health problems all come from that same group. And as a result, there's some overlap between the two but I don't think there's any benefit in itself of mental illness. Sure, no, I'm not, I wasn't suggesting it was benefit. I just think, I think it's been nuisance yes. because it gets in the way and it is so debilitating. And indeed, and indeed those, those artists we know suffered from severe mental illnesses, always did their best, their work at another time. The illness yes. was an interruption. Yes. Uh, and they were never productive when they were ill. In the same way as you've managed to cope with the anxiety by teaching yourself, I mean, in a behavioural way, not to have that, is it not possible to do the same with depression? No, because it's not a false perception, certainly not for me. Um, I sometimes don't realise it's happening. It's, hap it's something that happens to my body. I suddenly realise that I'm getting colder than usual, and I need uh, more clothing. My right. tastes change. I, I don't like I don't like vegetables anymore. I want biscuits. Um, <laughs> noises are, are louder. I don't like being in crowds. Wow. And sometimes I realise belatedly that I'm depressed because I notice the physical symptoms of it, and then right. I look inside my mind and think, "Oh, that's that's what that that's that's what's happening again, isn't it?" And all those things those physiological things and the perception, the subjective experience come as a package. So it does, it does feel like a real physical illness. In the start of um, Porpoise, there's a, a horrendous uh, plane crash. Are we, it was that in a way you writing or trying to write yourself away from the, those feelings that you have had about traveling in a plane. So yes, the plane crashed at the beginning of the porpoise. Um, some of it came from the same, um, the same idea that drove the beginning of Curious Incident, 
how can I how can I grab someone's attention? What's a really vivid opening image? Um, part of it I stole from a wonderful film called uh, Wild Tales, Relatos Salvajes, which I recommend to we recommend to absolutely everyone. I won't tell you why, because if you see the film, you'll understand what I stole. And it's an amazing scene. But yes, there is something, um, there is something about making readers experience of fear that you yourself fear, which somehow shares the load a little. Um, I also find my own fear both terrifying and quite funny at the same time. Um, more seriously on top of that, there's another principle which I think works throughout the entire novel and throughout many other things I've written, which is that the things we fear most need to be stared in the face. If you turn away either from other people's suffering or from the monsters that you yourself experience, it makes them worse. The very hardest things in life are made a little easier by accepting them, by, by looking at them straight ahead. I think we all know that horrible tracking shot in horror movies down the poorly lit hotel corridor with the flickering lights and the dark turnings. Yeah. That's the frightening bit. Whatever lurks at the end of that corridor is always less frightening than the corridor itself. So I, it, for me, it's a moral position that I take both in life and in, and in literature. Don't turn, away from the, don't turn away from the worst things, steer into them. It's interesting. And it's important that we do that with ourselves and with other people. Listen to them, listen to the things that they're really suffering from and the things they're experiencing. I, I thought it was a fantastic novel. Thank you. Uh, Absolutely amazing. And um, I, I'm tempted to ask what the purpose of it was, but uh, well, I think we'll probably cut that out. <laughs> but, the, um, uh, but do tell me why you wrote that one. Well, there's a, there's a quite specific backstory to the purpose. Again, different from everything else I've written um, in that some years ago, the Hogarth Press um, started to commission a series of novelizations of Shakespeare's plays. Um, Hagseed by Margaret Atwood was, was one, for example. Um, others have been written by Jeanette Winterson, for example. Um, Howard Jacobson wrote another. Um, Joe Nesbo wrote another. Mm. At the time, it seemed to me to require too much chutzpah to take a play that was of itself a masterpiece and turn it into what would inevitably be a novel that was not as good. But it stayed at the back of my mind because I did like the idea. And then I reread Pericles and I realized two things. One is that it's not very good. <laughs> I think ironically, I think it's one of the most performed plays since Shakespeare's death over that historical period, but it's very little performed now. It's, it's fairly ropey. Um, doesn't hang together very well. It was co-written by uh, Shakespeare and George Wilkins, who was a, a terrible human being from, from what we can gather. He wrote, he wrote one other play, but is mostly known through local court records for his, his, uh, his fraud and his abuse of women. So I thought that if I got Shakespeare on an off day, and if I did a version of Pericles, then I might stand a chance in the fight. Um, and I wouldn't be accused of having mauled and damaged a masterpiece. And at the same time, there was, I thought, a wrong done by the play itself at the beginning. It involves a king and his daughter involved in what the play calls an incestuous relationship, what we would now call, you know, sustained sexual abuse over many, many years. He needs to marry her off because if he doesn't marry her off, Everyone will wonder why he's not marrying her off. But if she gets married to a husband, then the husband will find out what's been happening. So he, he invents a kind of fairy tale um, puzzle for potential suitors in which they have to solve this little um, puzzle verse he gives them. The answer to which is the relationship between him um, and his daughter. 
if they can't get it right, they're beheaded. Um, and everyone has been beheaded so far, who's come seeking the hand of the daughter. And Pericles comes along and he solves the riddle and then he runs away. He realizes that this young woman has been abused by her father. And instead of stepping in to rescue her, he just heads off around the Mediterranean, having lots of fun, lots of adventures. And that constitutes the meat of the play. This poor young woman is given no name. She's given two lines. Um, and the only other time we hear about it in the play is when a messenger comes on to say that she and her father have been killed by a stroke of lightning in a chariot as God's vengeance for their relationship. I thought, let's, let's do a version of Pericles, which is also an argument with Shakespeare and Wilkins about what they did to this young woman and give her a voice this time around. Was the novel basically planned out? Um, the, I was going to say the joyous thing about that, this novel. The thing about this novel, which was less onerous than every other novel I've written, was that I had a rough framework to start with. Right. I had the play itself. And, I, and obviously I, I messed about with it a great deal, but I knew that there was that structure in the background. So I knew roughly where I needed to get to at the end and I needed... I knew roughly the sort of journey that I would take. I also knew that I wanted to start in the present day with this relationship between the king, in this case, a very wealthy man and his daughter, this, this abusive relationship, because I wanted to take away that patina of age and antiquity that we often spread over old stories so that these terrible, terrible acts become acceptable to us. Um, we read Ovid not really noticing that it's just a sort of catalogue of rape cases, for example. Um, many, many paintings are the same, but they have a sort of decorousness. I and mean, if you strip away the decorousness, you realise something truly horrific is happening in that painting. And I thought if I could bring it into the present day, it would remind readers that what is happening between this father and the daughter is something happening somewhere on your street right now, somewhere sure. around the corner. But if I stayed in the present day, then I couldn't have pirates and sword fights uh, and shipwrecks. So I then had to find a way of going it back into the past so I could get the best of both worlds. It's an extraordinary book because you are, um, you, I think you're a phenomenal storyteller and it, it is a real page turner, but by goodness, you make it difficult for us. No, oh, I like you to get value for money out of it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea that you write a book that someone thinks I might have to read that again. Um, yeah. I like books which challenge me. Um, I am, I confess, something of a snob. I, I, I don't read to, to kick back. If I, if I really need to re relax, um, I sometimes watch, you know, box sets and uh, TV miniseries. That, that's what does it for me. Um, with books, if I'm going to read something, I want to emerge from the far end of the book feeling different, feeling, feeling I've had muscles exercised I didn't quite know existed beforehand, thinking that the world looks a little different. So I like, I like to be worked a little by, by the author. Um, so I want to do that for, for readers. Because as I said before, I'm writing for the other version of myself, which doesn't know that I've written this book, which has just come upon it by chance. Um, I do realize that um, as with everything else I've written, I lose yet more fans of Curious Incident who pick up another novel by me and realize that it's not a straightforward chronological novel about a small group of people. And, in the porpoise, it's, it's, it has three, three sort of timelines, as it were, that we switch between. Um, some years ago, I, actually maybe it was just after the porpoise came out, I was doing an interview and I said rather sort of jokingly, uh, my career involves um, repeatedly um, losing fans of Curious Incident. And somehow they missed the tone of irony in my voice and um, reported it uh, as, me saying that's why I wrote. 
in order to throw off these fans of curious incidents. <laughs> Whereas I don't. It's just it's just a you know it happens. It happens because I want to write something different and a little bit challenging each time, so that I go somewhere else. Yes. Well, it would be. Um... It would possibly be very, very boring um, to have found one thing that's successful and then do it again and again and again. I, and I, I can name many artists, being the world that I am in, many artists who have made um, uh, huge amounts of money finding one thing that worked for them and then doing them again and again and again for the whole of their careers. And... Um, I always look at that, and I, I can't believe that that they can actually cope with it without going bananas. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing it brings them is is money, and um, presumably fame. But yeah. fame isn't much use to anybody, really. It's a... I have been asked many times, um, usually by younger readers, um, if I'm going to write Curious Incident Part Two. And I, I always have to write back and say, no, it's your job to write Curious Incident Part yeah. 2. The, um, uh, you, in a way, you leave the, the, the porpoise at the end uh, in a situation where a lot of people who didn't actually have an understanding of what you're about would think that's left it open for someone to write Part 2 or the next version. Well, I very deliberately so. There is an ambiguous ending, and I, I, I like ambiguous endings because there are no there there are no absolute endings in life, are there? Everything is already constantly unfurling. Um, while something comes to an end, another story is 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 starting off, is or is already going. Um, and indeed, if you go back to Curious Incident, the end of that is in fact deliberately ambiguous. If I remember the scene accurately, Siobhan, his teacher, is having a conversation with him. And he says, I've done this, I've done that. Now I can do anything, can't I? Can't I? Um, almost all the readers have answered that question quietly. Yes, of course you can do anything. But that answer isn't there in the book. It's, it's, it's left hanging. And in sure. fact, this, this was made very clear during the, the stage version of the play. Um, Simon Stevens, who adapted it, and I um, really like the fact that in, in that final scene, Christopher asked that question. I can do anything now, can't I? Can't I? And then there's a, a long silence in which his teacher does not answer. And it's deliberately an uncomfortable silence. And then suddenly, fizz, we go to blackout. And um, both he and I think of that as deliberately ambiguous. When the play is performed um, in front of different audiences, you get different reactions. Uh, young audiences and, to some extent, American audiences, at that point in the play, they cheer because they assume the answer is yes. Older audiences, and particularly audiences in the UK, who tend to be a little more cynical, react in a, in, in a slightly more downbeat way to the whole thing. Um, one of the best reactions came during what the National term, their relaxed performances, a, a wonderful institution um, that I think the National Theatre spearheaded. Instead of saying, we're gonna have some performances for people with a range of disabilities, they said, we're gonna have some performances in which there will be a chill out room, the house lights will be a little bit brighter, um, the effects will not be not quite so intense on stage, and you in the audience, feel free to come and go and do what you want. Some of the audience were just ordinary theatre goers and some people had specific problems which made them feel ill at ease in a theatre. It could be anything from autism to Parkinson's to ADHD to whatever. So it gave a wonderfully diverse audience. And some of these audiences inevitably had life experiences were not a million miles away from Christopher's. And on one of these occasions, right at the end, Christopher says, I can do anything, can't I? can't I? Then this long silence and a little voice comes from the stalls shouting, no! <laughs> that's wonderful. That's, that's, that's been my favourite reaction. Do you think anyone, or can you see how someone could stage uh, Porpoise? I can't. I mean, it could obviously be made into a film. 
But do you think it would ever make a stage play? I think not, but, but as I said earlier, I'm not a natural writer for the stage. I thought that Curious was almost by definition the most unadaptable for stage novel you could have. Stage is radically third person, isn't it? We never see inside anyone's head. We just no. see their actions and their words. Curious Incident is entirely from inside the head and the point of view of one extremely unreliable narrator. And there are lots of illustrations in the book too. And I, I said to Simon at the time, I'm, I'm not, surely this is impossible. He said, let me try it, let me try it. And he's a writer for stage and he can see how these problems can be solved. And right from the beginning, he had a sort of inkling of ideas, which was incomprehensible to me. If anyone's seen the play, they will know that there's a lot of movement in it, sort of borderline dance ballet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He knew he wanted that from the off. I had no idea how that was gonna work, but he could sense it and it works, it works beautifully. So I would be a fool to say that you couldn't put the porpoise on stage. Um, however, there is something about, stage finds it very, very hard to do outdoor stories. If you think of some of the best contemporary plays, they are all set indoors. There is something of the burning building about a good stage play. It, it might not be the top of a tower block on fire, but it, it, it could be a sort of living room with French windows. It, it could be a prison cell. It works when there's a kind of pressure cooker atmosphere on stage because stage works by conflict. As Simon, who adapted Curious, said to me, he said, you need a sense that a play is like a football match and each scene is like a football match. You don't know who's gonna win, but they're all trying to win. It's a contest, even if it's, an, even if it's Chekhov, it's not really spoken of, or it's Beckett. It's hard to sort of work out what the, what the, the game is but it's happening on stage. You can't describe the weather for 10 pages on stage. It's all about conflict. The porpoise has some conflict, but it's, it's, an out, it's almost entirely an outdoor kind of book. It's about big journeys and open spaces and stretches of time. So I think it would be hard, but as I have learned, I should shut up about these things because other people are wiser in this respect. Do you want to say anything about the next thing you're doing? I would love to be able to say something about the next thing I'm doing, but I'm, I'm experiencing a long and extremely uncomfortable period of writer's block in which, in which absolutely nothing is coming. Um, can't draw, can't write. I'm having a great deal of trouble, trouble reading. So if anyone out there has some really, really good ideas, then... Actually, <laughs> let me let me let me take that let me take that back. The problem is not ideas. Ideas are ten a penny out there, you know. As everyone says, there are only like five stories in the world. You know, you just, just got to pick one and do something do something different with it. What you need is a kind of mental acuity and sufficient energy. But for me, perhaps the most important thing is a sense of necessity. Something needs to be written. You have to think to yourself, I am confident that this story needs to be told. The world needs this storytelling. And if you haven't got that sense of meaningful purpose, I think it's really hard to write. It's hard for me to write. I can't just do the next novel. The next novel needs to be something that has a purpose and a necessity to it. It's been absolutely fabulous listening to you. Really, really tremendous. Enjoyed it hugely. And uh, I, I hope it wasn't <clears throat> too much of a chore for you. Not at all. It was a pleasure. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.